and welcome to another episode of Leadership Table Talk, a show designed to help you develop and improve your leadership and management skills and talents. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Gellum, a retired Air Force Colonel and former member of the Senior Executive Service Corps with the Department of Defense at the Pentagon. As a member of the Executive Leadership Program at Georgetown University, I'm always looking for talk show guests to reinforce information that we discuss at the school. A topic of recent discourse was principled leadership, which is what gave me the impetus for today's show, which is entitled Principled Leadership, a four-star general's perspective on what matters. To discuss this topic with me is someone who exudes principled leadership. Having served his country for over 45 years, he is truly a leader's leader. Please help me to welcome to the show none other than Air Force retired General Larry O. Spencer. General, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Gillum. I'm happy to be here. Sir, it is just a pleasure to have you on the show today. And I want to begin by asking you, how does a young man from the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area go from being an airman basic in the Air Force to becoming not only a four-star general, but the vice chief of staff of the Air Force. Please tell us your story. Well, that's interesting. So you have to understand where I grew up. I grew up in uh, Southeast D.C. Uh, in the inner city. Uh, my mother uh, had not graduated from high school. Uh, and my father uh, was a career army uh, enlisted man. Uh, and so uh, I was, it was very confusing to me. Um, I grew up in an environment uh, that was sort of encapsulated by sports, so I was really in the sports. Um, and as I was in high school and I was on, you know, just about every sporting team they had, uh, and as I came up to graduation, I had a lot of football scholarship offers. And uh, the problem is, though, the challenge was I didn't have any help. My parents couldn't help me. They had never been to college. I was the oldest of six. Um, and so I was very confused. But the only thing that I really knew was football. And so back then, and they don't have it anymore, but back then, D.C. had a pretty robust uh, semi-pro football league. So I left high school and I played uh, semi-pro football. Uh, and then, uh, out of the blue, one day, I was over in Iverson Mall, which is off of Branch Avenue, mm -hmm. uh, and I was walking through the mall, and I literally sort of stumbled into the Air Force recruiter's office, uh, and when I stumbled out of there, I was in the Air Force. Oh, uh, still not exactly sure how that happens, and my parents didn't know anything about it, uh, so I went home and uh, told my father, uh, and they were all shocked, uh, but quite frankly, they were pleased. Now, you have to keep in mind, now, I'm going to ask you to use your imagination here, <laughs> okay. uh, because back then... You know, long hair uh, was the style, and, and I know it's hard to believe now, but I had a pretty big afro and, and the whole, you know, the, the bell-bottom pants and the whole high-platform shoes, and my mother used to shake her head, you know, wondering what's going to happen to this boy. Uh, so they were actually a little bit relieved, you know, that I was going into something structured. Uh, but I, uh, my father took me to the bus station down, downtown D.C. I went up to Baltimore to the uh, recruiting station. Uh, on to the uh, Baltimore Washington Airport and down to Lackland Air Force Base for basic training. Now the interesting thing about that is I had never even been to an airport, much less flown on an airplane. Uh, so it was my first experience flying uh, and I just loved it. Uh, and then when I got in basic training, I just sort of fell in love with the Air Force. Um, you know, as you, uh, as you probably know, uh, you know, you, you get into basic training, there are, are instructors screaming at you. That was, that was all natural to me having grown up in sports. Uh, and I just loved it. And then as I got in the Air Force, got to bases, uh, started to think about, do I really want to do this for a career? The thought occurred to me, well, if I'm going to do this, then I might as well do it as an officer. Uh, and so I enrolled in college, uh, did most of my school at night, at nights and on the weekends. Uh, I had a little bit of a hiccup when I was, happened to be stationed at Charleston Air Force Base, and I got approached to get out of the Air Force and play football again at Clemson. Uh, and, but by that time, I had uh, a wife and uh, two kids. <laughs> In hindsight, I probably could have made it work, but back then didn't think it would work. So I stayed in the Air Force, completed my degree, uh, went to officer's training school, and uh, sort of the rest is history. Wow, sir, that is so uh, wonderful that you've shared that story with us today. Now, let me ask you, we, we often hear about mentoring. Did you have a mentor along the way? Absolutely. I had many mentors. In fact, there were folks that were mentors for me who didn't know they were mentors <laughs> because um, one of the things that I've always been very driven and very competitive, and so I would always find folks that I felt like were really doing well, that were getting promoted rapidly, uh, that, that 
folks that I looked up, into my, looked up to in my unit, uh, and I would latch on to them. A again, in some cases they knew it, in some <laughs> cases they didn't. But I would watch them, try to emulate them. I would ask them questions, uh, how to be successful, what kind of training should I take? Tell me about leadership, how do you lead? You just won an award, how did you win that award? Uh, folks seem to look up to you, why? Uh, and so I was always very inquisitive. So I've, I've always, to this day, quite frankly, uh, had, uh, had mentors, and I always encourage others to seek out mentors as well. Okay, so I, I read in your bio that at a lot of the schools that you went to, you were a distinguished graduate. Yes. Did that come from having those mentors that said, when you not only go to school, but do the very best that you can? Absolutely, but first of all, it wasn't, uh, I, I'm always, I was been, I'm driven anyway, and yes. I don't know why, because I was a really bad student when I was growing up in school, uh, but for some reason, uh, the, at some point uh, in my life, the light bulb clicked, and, and it was, so it was, it was, it's always been my goal, if I'm gonna take a course, or, I'm, or if I'm gonna go to a school, then I wanna be the best. If, if there's an A to be earned, I wanna earn an A. If there's a distinguished graduate to be earned, I wanna earn it. Not that I'm any better than anybody else, mm -hmm. but I've always been driven to at least put forth that effort. And quite frankly, early on, some mentors helped me by saying, look, you're going to officer's training school and, and you're gonna learn a lot there. But there's this thing called distinguished graduate. And if you are a distinguished graduate, it means you're in the top 5% of the class. And what that means is when I write your evaluation, I get to say that you were a distinguished graduate, a distinguished graduate which separates you from your peers. So th those, although I was driven to try to always do my best, if I was lucky enough or fortunate enough to be a distinguished graduate, I always understood that that was yet one more thing that I had that maybe my peers didn't have. Wow, sir, that is uh, indeed wonderful information to share with those who are looking to um, advance in their leadership roles and so forth. Um, I, I had talked with you uh, earlier about General Cole Powell's book yeah, here. A hero of mine <laughs> and a mentor of mine, and he doesn't know it, <laughs> although I have met him several times. And you know, in his book, he talks about the 13 uh, principles or the rules that has become synonymous with uh, General Powell. Yes. So, sir, can I ask you, uh, do you have any of those like principles or things that uh, you have uh, developed over the course of your career? Sure. Well, first of all, um, I've always believed that as an individual and as a unit, you should try to be the absolute best you can be, the best unit you can be. If I had a squadron, or if I'm running a company like I am now, I want that company or unit to be the best it can be. So my first principle is, let's figure out what our job is, what our mission is, what is our task, and let's do it better than anyone else could do it. And so that was always exciting to me. I've always been, also been a big proponent of leadership by walking around. Uh, and, yes. and I do that today uh, as well as I've always done throughout my work life and my mm -hmm. Air Force career. Um, I just believe that, that Folks need to see their leader, and you need to see them. And I'm, you know, you need to look your folks in the eye, and they need to understand what your goals are, your vision is, uh, and you need to understand what their issues are and what their problems are. And so I've found that leadership by walking around has been really important for me because it, it helps me connect with the folks that I'm that I'm leading. Uh, I've also I've been a big proponent of creating an environment of innovation, uh, creating an environment that people feel creative. Uh, and they can think about new things, new technologies. Yes. Um, I mentioned to you earlier, coincidentally, I gave a commencement uh, address up in uh, the University of Pennsylvania uh, this weekend. And uh, one of the things we talked about was how fast technology moves. <laughs> and uh, I'm telling my age now, but you know, when I used to ride into a gas station with my father, uh, we would pull into a gas station and someone would actually come out and pump the gas. They would wash yes. the windshield, they would check the oil. <laughs> And they would give us something that a lot of those graduates had never seen before, and that was a map, mm -hmm. uh, because everyone used G yes. uses GPS now. Uh, when I was growing up, there was a phone booth on every corner. I mean, those are things that are unheard of now. Uh, just in my own lifetime, my first office in the Air Force, I had a Royale typewriter on my wow. desk. I mean, most people have never even seen a typewriter. Um, so I, I've always wanted to have a, a, an environment of creativity and innovation so that we could continue to get better. And I think finally, and, and I don't say finally because it's least important, but I say finally because I want to emphasize this, I've always made it a point of trying to take care of my people, the folks that work for me, folks that work around me, uh, identifying those superstars so that, so, that, so that I can help them advance in their career, right. uh, identifying uh, folks who are really high performers so I can reward them, I can promote them. Uh, what I have found is, is success breeds success. Yes, and so yes. what I've tried to do 
when I come in new to a unit and say, look, we're, we're the best, you're the best. It, it, the, the only difference, the only, only thing separating you from those who have been identified as the best is no one knows it yet. <laughs> That's my job. I'm going to make sure that people know how good you are. All you have to do is perform. And so uh, those principles uh, are ones that I've always taken with me. By the way, you mentioned uh, uh, General Powell, Colin Powell. A uh, funny quick story here. <laughs> Uh, I th and I, because I thought it would end when I, when I took off the uniform, and it hasn't. Um, so in D.C., walking, walking around in uniform, and even now in a suit, if I had a dollar for every time someone asked me if I was Colin Powell, I would be rich. <laughs> now, I don't think I look anything like him, but apparently, <laughs> apparently other people do. Um, so I, 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 wish I, I, I wish I was as successful as he was, or he is. Sir, you've just said a um, a mouthful in everything that you've said because it reminds me of a lot of things that I've read about you in your bio, not only um, when you uh, became a comptroller mm -hmm. or, uh, yes, a comptroller down at Seymour Johnson, yes. and your unit won the best uh, comptroller squadron in the Air Force, right. I believe, right. twice. Right. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, uh, <laughs> again, that's a perfect example of what I mentioned about my uh, making, having a unit believe they're the best. Yes. Because when I arrived at Seymour Johnson, uh, they hadn't won any awards. And so I started identifying folks that were really good and turning them in for awards. But the biggest thing down there, quite frankly, was um, I arrived at Seymour Johnson just prior to Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm. And so my unit was in the middle of that war. Middle of that war and it was an incredible experience. Uh, and we, we, rightfully so, the unit received a lot of uh, accolades for what yes. they did. Uh, but if, if you can, you know, again, this is sort of foreign now, but uh, when the war started, I literally had two of my folks on the second airplane to deploy with a briefcase full of money and checks. I'm talking about just like in the movies, yes. you know, the, the stacks of cash, <laughs> because then we didn't have electronic transfer, mm -hmm. people got paid with a check, uh, and so it was a big deal to get mm -hmm. money over to the theater, mm -hmm. and then start very quickly buying things, buying everything from food and water to tents to equipment oh, to yes. services yes. so that the, the wing could fall in and, mm -hmm. and start operating. Um, you'll appreciate this. Uh, one of the things I was not aware of was that were a little bit unusual about that is my accounting and finance officer that I, that I deployed was a woman. And uh, when she arrived, uh, the first thing she found out is she could not go outside the gate without wearing an abaya. So we had to go by all the women that were going outside the, the, the wire, if you will, an abaya. Uh, and as the culture was in Saudi Arabia, uh, the vendors would not do business with a yes. woman. So uh, she, and she didn't resent it, but she, you know, she, we were in their country, so she uh, went by their customs. But she would actually go downtown with a, a male that worked yes. for her, NCO, and listen to the conversation and then she would count off the money to the male who would count off the money to the vendor. Uh, but it was, so it was a, it was a very yes, unique yes, uh, and, and interesting experience, but yes. uh, I don't take any credit for that. I mean, the, the unit really performed well and they deserved uh, everything, that, all the, uh, the uh, recognition that they got. Well, sir, that is outstanding. And it looks like we have come up on our first break. So please stay tuned and we will be back with you shortly. You could choose to join a gang. You could try the latest drugs. You could even choose to drop out of school. You can try to avoid the difficulties in life with a quick fix, or you can face them head on. She did. Make the right choices today and be ready for the challenges tomorrow. This message is brought to you by the U.S. Air Force. Welcome back to Leadership Table Talk. My guest today is retired General Larry Spencer. Sir, before the break, we were talking about the success that had occurred at one of your organizations. But I also recall reading in your bio that there was an award named after you at the Air Staff, and that dealt with innovation. So can you talk a little bit about that award? Sure, I was uh, very much humbled and honored that the Air Force would name an award after me um, and it's, it, it is an innovation award, uh, but uh, it, it, the way it came about is sort of interesting. You may recall a couple of years ago, something called sequestration yes, sir. Uh, was sort of uh, <laughs> thrust on the services. Yes. And uh, as the vice chief of staff, it was my job and the undersecretary of the Air Force to kind of work our way through those reductions. Unfortunately, the sequestration trigger hit right in the middle of the fiscal year. So we had six months to 
accomplish a year's worth of, of reductions. Uh, and so we did a lot of bad things that we wish we wouldn't have had to have done. For example, we actually stood down a frontline fighter and bomber aircraft yes. because we couldn't afford to fly them. We furloughed our civilian employees, which was awful. We actually sent them home uh, because we couldn't afford to pay them. Uh, but one of the things we did, and what I wanted to do was to, I wanted to involve everyone in the Air Force from airmen on up, uh, because I know, I've known from experience that that's where the good ideas generally come from the bottom up. And so I created something called Every Dollar Counts. Yes. Uh, and that involved, a, uh, among other things, a 30-day window where every airman in the Air Force could send me directly their ideas for saving money. Uh, and we weren't sure how that was going to work out, but I got to tell you, I was pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm. On 1 May, we got 1,700 suggestions. Wow. As we progressed through the month, near the end of the month, we were up to 17,000, <laughs> and I had to cut them off because we couldn't read them all. Uh, but it was great. I mean, airmen got involved. They sent in great suggestions and allowed us to save a lot of money. Uh, and, and we kept that going, by the way. The, the, our, the current Secretary of the Air Force, uh, Deborah Lee James, came yes. in. She picked up right where I left off. And so I was, I was surprised, but I was very honored and humbled and, and, and quite frankly, grateful that they would see fit to name an award after me. Oh, that is wonderful, sir. I would like to just uh, commend you on that award. Well, thank you. And um, I would also like to ask, uh, having led at so many different levels, what advice would you give um, emerging leaders today in sure. terms of uh, leadership? Yeah, my, my uh, sort of core advice to new leaders coming up is to be yourself because there are a lot of uh, folks, I think, coming up that will look around at, at other leaders and want to be like them. You really have to be like yourself. You have to lead like Dr. Gillum mm -hmm. would lead. Uh, you have introverts, extroverts, and everything in between. You just have to be who you are. And the reason for that is you have to be genuine. You know, if, if you're an introvert and all of a sudden you go out in front of a unit and start screaming and yelling, <laughs> they're going to know, they're going to see through that. They're going to know you're not, that's not who you are. Um, so I think it's really important to lead within yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the big advice I normally give folks is just keep doing what you're doing. Whatever made you successful to this point, continue that, but don't try to be anyone that you're not. Sir, you have so much advice to give. Is there, let me put you on the spot here, <laughs> the possibility of your writing a book? <laughs> oh, uh, well, uh, interesting question. Uh, I've, all, I've actually just written a book. Uh, it's called The Green Eye Shades of War, and it's about uh, financial management during war, which is, I think, pretty interesting because I went back and looked at World War II, Vietnam, and then my own experience in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and Iraqi Freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of folks don't think about how integral it is to have financial management go well uh, in, a, in a war environment. Um, so that will be published by Air University soon. Great. And I'm currently yes. working on a, a more of a memoir, yes. uh, uh, something sort of about my life story. Uh, so I'm, I'm currently working through that. So I enjoy writing, and, uh, and I hope folks enjoy reading it. Oh, absolutely, sir. Uh, when you get those books out, I would love to have you to come back on the show. Well, I, would you I, do that? I would be happy to do that, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, I'd like to now transition and talk a little bit about what you're doing today. Can you talk about how your leadership may have changed from going from a military organization to now a, uh, a corporation? Yes. Uh, so I'm the president of the Air Force Association, which is really exciting for me because even though I'm out of uniform, it still allows me to be active and engaged with airmen yes. uh, and active and engaged with national defense. Yes. So the Air Force, Air, uh, Air Force Association was created in 1946. It was ostensibly created uh, by General Jimmy Doolittle of the Doolittle Raiders, yes. um, and he wanted to keep the gang together. So these were, as folks were dispersing from the military after World War II, he wanted to keep them together. Uh, he also wanted to create the Air Force as a separate service. Which, he, which they did in 1947. So the Air Force Association was responsible for that. And over the years, uh, the Air Force Association has done so much to assist the Air Force. Um, for example, a lot of folks don't realize that the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force came from the Air Force Association, that the Community College of the Armed Forces came from the Air Force Association, uh, that the 12 Outstanding Airmen Program came from the Air Force Association, that the Air Force Memorial uh, that overlooks the Pentagon mm -hmm. up on the hill uh, the money was raised by folks that work with the Air Force Association. Um, so our, our job is to, to promote a dominant Air Force, and we do that every day. I'm on the Hill quite a bit, uh, educating uh, folks about the Air Force and talking about Air Force capabilities. Um, we, we provide professional development for airmen. Uh, and so, for example, what I have told folks is, you know, if you're a lawyer, your professional, uh, your professional 
uh, um, organization is the American Bar Association. Mm -hmm. If you're a doctor, like my brother is, mm -hmm. his professional development organization is the, the American Medical Association, the AMA. If you're an airman, your professional development organization is the, F, is the Air Force Association yes. or the A, AFA. Mm -hmm. So that's what we provide for airmen. We put out a great magazine. We put out a, yes. actually a, a daily report. Every day we put out a report on what's going on in the Air Force so they can keep up with their profession, the profession of arms. Sir, um, I would put this out here. I am a life member. Oh, good, of, good. Because uh, I was going to ask you that after this. I was going to ask you that after you got done. And I look forward to getting my monthly magazine <laughs> every month. Good, good. It's, it's a good magazine. <laughs> Let me ask, does the association have anything on the horizon? Yes, we, a couple of things. We, uh, first of all, uh, we're starting a new uh, leadership series. Oh, wow. And so the first one will be held at Andrews Air Force Base on the 17th of June. Mm -hmm. And the first one will focus on our enlisted force. So the, the way it will work is we will fill up the base theater uh, with airmen. And then we're going to bring in mentors and speakers. For yes. example, Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, uh, Jim Cody, yes. will be there. Yes. Uh, we will have a Chief Master Sergeant Jack Johnson from uh -huh. Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're actually going to have a, a surprise guest for them, a motivational <laughs> speaker as well. Um, so it, it's all about Air Force Association giving back to airmen, professional development, this won't cost our airmen a dime. They just get to come in and be and, and learn more about their profession uh, from those that have been very successful. Uh, also, we have in September a large air, space, and cyber conference symposium uh, held at the Inner Harbor, the, not the Inner Harbor, but the Harbor uh, ho Hotel over in, uh, in Maryland. Uh, and that's, uh, we, we do two of those, two big conferences a year, one in D.C. area and one in Orlando, Florida. But this is our big one. Uh, and so there will be, you know, anywhere from six to 10,000 folks there. We will, we will have exhibitors there from the big aerospace companies and other companies outside of aerospace. We will have the chief uh, staff of the Air Force speak, brand new chief at that point. Uh, we will have the secretary of the Air Force speak. We will have the chief master of the Air Force. We will, we're still hoping to have the deputy, Sec deputy secretary of defense speak, uh, as well as other speakers. So it will be probably the single best professional development opportunity that, that any airman could ever have. So we're really looking forward to it. So, sir, when did you uh, mention the date uh, that I must have missed? Uh, it's that. the 21st through the 23rd oh, of September. Wow. And it's going to be a great event. Right after our birthday. <laughs> yeah, yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> well, sir, uh, today, sometimes when you talk to young people about joining the military, there seems to be some uh, hesitancy. Sure. What would you say to a young person today because of your experiences in sure. the Air Force? I would say the Air Force is a great place to start. Whether you remain in for a full career or not, you can make that decision. Uh, but particularly if you're someone like I was, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. Uh, and the Air Force, all the services for that matter, mm -hmm. but in my experience, the Air Force just provides great opportunity. It provides great training. Uh, so if you decide to separate from the Air Force, you've got a great skill. Um, it, it provides great leadership opportunity. It provides travel. Um, it, it provides a discipline area uh, or a, a discipline environment uh, so you can, can learn how to, to, uh, to study, how to prepare. You know, when I talk to employers now, they love Air Force folks and they love military folks in general because they've got a strong work ethic. Mm -hmm. They show up on time. They work hard. They study. They want to advance. Uh, all of these traits that every employer looks for, the military provides that. That is wonderful, sir. Uh, let me ask you, I, I constantly ask my guests about this, the importance of integrity Absolutely. as a leader. Yes. Can you comment uh, on it, that? It is critical uh, to have it. You, you know, you, first of all, it, it, you, you will not be an effective leader if you, if you don't have integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, you won't be an effective follower mm -hmm. if you don't have integrity right. either. Uh, people that work with you, work for you, or that supervise you have to be able to trust you. Uh, and they have to be able to know when you tell them something, you're telling the truth. Yes. It doesn't mean you won't make a mistake, but it does mean that you are honest, uh, that you are forthright, uh, and, and, and that you can, people can depend on you. This is particularly critical in the military because you have to be able to trust the person next to you, particularly, particularly if you're in a, in a hostile environment where there may be, uh, uh, there, there may be uh, hostilities going on. Yes. You have to be able to trust the person next to you that they said they're going to do what you, that they told you they were going to do. Uh, and so integrity and trust uh, and telling the truth, even when it's not popular, is what I tell my kids, <laughs> or telling the truth even when it's hurt, when it hurts, is very critical. That is wonderful, sir, because I think uh, for any leader, they need to understand that. And another thing that I think that leaders need to also understand, especially emerging leaders, is that 
with leadership comes challenges. Right. So what were some of the challenges that you may have faced and how did you handle those? Yeah, I've had a, a ton of challenges, <laughs> but I'll, I'll speak about one that you may be familiar okay. with. Okay, so you, I was the wing commander at Hill Air Force Base <laughs> and you were a squadron commander yes, there. Sir. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure if you were there when I first arrived, but when I first arrived at Hill Air Force Base, we were facing a major operational inspection. And, the, and as you know, Hill is a, one of the largest installations in the Air Force. Yes. Um, and the base had not had an inspection in five years. And the other uh, challenge I had was that the, uh, they had just had a practice inspection before I arrived and they failed it. <laughs> uh, and so the, the challenge here at a, at a logistics center, which is a Hill Air Force Base is, it's, 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 it's more of a challenge than, than, than other uh, bases that, that strictly have just airplanes on it rather than depot or repair of airplanes because the majority of the base were civilians uh, who are all great but who may not have come up uh, in an environment uh, of, of operational uh, inspection. So I literally had to, to educate and convince and lead 15,000 people through what an inspection was and how important it was for us to do yes. well. And so the first thing I did was I went through a series of, of briefings in the base theater, one after another, because you can't get 15,000 people, and really uh, talk to them about what we were about to go through and why it was so critical that we do well. Uh, motivating everyone, firing everybody up, going out, doing some practices, right there cheering them on, being a coach, uh, being a leader. Uh, it was probably one of the biggest challenges that I've had because uh, According to my own boss, they were on a path to fail that, and wow. we ended up actually getting the highest score of any logistics center yes, in the sir. Air Force. So, uh, so that was quite a challenge for me, but I really enjoyed it. Well, sir, thank you so much. Well, it looks like we are coming up on the end of the show, but I want to thank you, sir, for taking time out of your very busy schedule to come and be a guest today. And I also want to thank you, our audience, for uh, tuning in to our show today. So if you have any questions at all, please contact me at my website, www.m2gleadershipbids.com. Thank you very much. Thank you.